Welcome everyone to Prophecy USA, a Bible study podcast specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. My name is Rick Pearson. And I'm Karen Pearson. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about the powers of the world to come and where we are on God's prophetic time clock. Mm. Uh, In the last several weeks, we've made some offers uh, for our book, The Hour That Changes Everything. And this book has 53 descriptions of a Latter-day nation called Latter-day Babylon. The United States of America meets every description right out of this book from 750 years before Christ to 2,000 years ago with the, with the uh, prophet John on the Isle of Patmos. So we are in Bible prophecy, folks. We want you to listen to what we believe is coming to the United States of America. Uh, but before we do that, Karen's going to read an email from our past lessons from somebody that ordered these 10 books and shared them with others. Go ahead, Karen. This is Edwin and Annie. We would like to order the 10 package protocol to distribute to our families and friends that have difficulty believing the truth. Annie and I have been following you on Thursdays in your Bible study and Sundays on TV at one o'clock. We've been so blessed by your program and are connecting the points in the Bible so we can understand the prophecies in the Bible. Annie and I are true believers in Jesus and the plan of salvation and try our best to follow what Jesus teaches us. We bless you both in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for your ministry and pray that God will open people's eyes to see the truth about our Savior Jesus Christ. Bless you both. Folks, thank you so much for that letter or that email. And folks, we are here for one reason, to expose what's happening in the world in line with this Bible. There's a reason why you were born There's a reason why you were born into this generation and there is a purpose behind you being here and there's a purpose behind this Bible study. Mm. So um, two weeks ago, or last week, we did a a message called God Laughs When Science Opposes Him. There's a lot of people today, politicians, and they're saying that they follow the science, which in many cases we should interpret that we should follow the money mm. instead of the science. Yes. Um, James 1, 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And last week, we learned that God created the science. We, man just discovered it. And what happens is man takes his eyes off of God, the giver of, of all good gifts, And he starts looking at the gifts and figures he doesn't need God. This is a trick of the enemy. And it it happens eons ago before uh, the Bible was ever written with with a person by the name of Lucifer who was in heaven. He was covered with jewels and rubies. And he had pipes, musical pipes in his body. This is Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 38. And God would breathe on Lucifer, and the music would come out of Lucifer, and he led worship in heaven. Mm. But that archangel of worship looked at all the gifts, and he thought, I don't need God. And the Bible says the mystery of iniquity was birthed in him. He turned his eyes against God, looked at the gifts. God cast him to the earth and a third of the angels that followed him. So this is what happens In the latter days, when man starts taking his eyes off of God and starts looking at the gifts instead of the God who is the Father of light and the giver of all gifts. Mm -hmm. Now, last week we said uh, that, that God laughs when science challenges him. And in Psalms 37, it says, The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked for he sees that his day is coming. Now, have you ever noticed the response of the Baal worshipers today Mm. since Roe versus Wade is being reconsidered by SCOTUS? Have you noticed the rage, the gnashing of teeth? Have you noticed the lies that CNN and MSNBC report about the radicalized mega supporters who are threatening our democracy. 
That's an absolute lie. No one is threatening our democracy by changing Roe versus Wade and bringing it back to the state and let people vote on it. Mm -hmm. So it's absolute lunacy what the media is reporting. The people who disagree with abortion are not threatening anyone or anything. They're not threatening to burn down buildings or riot or cause damage. But those who want abortion, which we've already established is bail worship, the shedding of innocent blood, they're the ones that are saying that there's going to be riots. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, in this Bible, time and time and time again, when the covenant nation of Israel shed innocent blood, it was the only thing that guaranteed God's judgment to come down on Israel. And it's the same thing as abortion. Abortion is a form of Baal worship. It's the right to kill your own children. This is a spiritual thing that's happening. It's not a political thing that's happening in the United States of America. Now, in 2 Kings 23 or 24, it's, uh, the prophet said this, Surely this came upon Judah, the judgment of, on, on Judah, at the command of the Lord. The Lord commanded the judgment to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh. Now, according to all that he had done, for the shedding of innocent blood that he had shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would, would not Pardon. pardon it. God would not pardon it. Hmm. So, science, as we know, was not invented by man. It was just discovered by man. Lucifer did not create his body and his rubies and his jewels. God did. But just as Lucifer looked at the gifts and started worshiping them, Babylon, this latter-day nation, takes their eyes off of God and they start worshiping the gifts and they forsake the God who is the giver of all good gifts. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that at the sound of the trump, the Father of Lights will call forth His bride instantaneously and every molecule in their body will be accelerated to the speed of light? Now this is what... We talked about last week how there's particles in your body, molecules, they move at different speeds, but your spirit moves at a higher speed. The molecules in your spirit move at a higher speed than what the molecules in your flesh move. Mm -hmm. And you can't see into the invisible realm, but God can. So what is happening in the invisible realm when we see this manifestation of all of this hatred and this rioting and this threats, what is manifesting in all these people who want to shed innocent blood? Mm. Is it possible that the same spirits that were cast out of heaven are now here and they're manifesting and they want to kill, steal, and destroy, which is the three signs of when demonic activity is taking place? Mm -hmm. And there's no rationale behind it. Uh, in in uh, 2012, one of the world's most robust experiments took place in Geneva, Switzerland. And we talked about this last week. I'm just doing a quick review. And they built a 17-mile tunnel, an atom smasher, $4 billion. And at the end of their experiment... To the cheers and standing ovations, scientists at the world's biggest atom smasher claimed the discovery of a new atom, a sub, calling it the God particle. A subatomic particle. A subatomic particle, they called it the God particle, which proved that different particles move at different speeds, and they call it the God particle, because it was something they'd never ex discovered before. Mm -hmm. Now, those particles 
are all around us, molecules, atoms. But in your spirit, when God breathed his spirit into man, man became a living soul. He scooped up the dirt and he made man out of the dirt of the ground. But you know, your heart pumps all the time. Think about this. Where does that energy come from? It doesn't come from your brain. It doesn't come from your flesh. It comes from that divine matter that God breathed into you, into Adam at his creation. And you have an eternal spirit inside of you. Mm -hmm. And so do I. When that spirit leaves the body, the body dies. And the body goes back to the dust from whence it came, but your spirit returns to the God who gave it. Created it, yes. So we're living right now in an atmosphere where a lot of people aren't looking into the invisible realm. They're just looking at the material realm, and they're not considering that we're more than just flesh and blood. When you have a baby inside of you, that baby has a spirit. When you remove that baby and take its life, that spirit goes back to the God who gave it. Yes. And this is what causes the judgment, because God is a just God. And those children are in heaven and they say, I was killed, innocent, innocently killed before I even got to be born. Now, Jeremiah, it says that he was called while, while you were, before I formed you in the womb, Jeremiah, I called thee and ordained thee to be a prophet. Mm -hmm. How many apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists have we murdered out of the 65 million abortions in the nation how many, how many people have we killed that were sent by God to do certain ministries? Mm -hmm. So from a purely secular humus point of view, what does it matter? If somebody's pregnant and they don't want that child, big deal. But from a spiritual matter, it's a big deal. It's a big deal in the eyes of God. Now, if you don't believe in God, you get angry at people that do. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a war on women. We know what this Bible says, what will happen to the nation if you shed and kill your children before they're born. Yes. It will pull down judgment, guaranteed. So... Um, According to Colossians 1.16, it says, Jesus Christ is above all things created that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by him and for him. That child in the womb has a spirit. You cannot see it and you cannot see my spirit. But when you start shedding innocent blood, the Bible says, the least you've done to these, my children, you have done it unto me. And this is serious stuff that's happening right now in North America. There is a battle raging. And it's not a battle between liberals and conservatives. It's not a battle between... Um, Left and right. Left and right, progressives, conservatives. We have liberals and conservatives in Canada. You have Republicans and Democrats. This is a battle in the invisible realm of the spirit world where a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light are colliding. Yes. And we're watching it manifest right now in front of us. Mm -hmm. So this is what's happening. Um, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. What we're going to look at today is, is God going to move in America 
and send warnings to us that believe in the realm of the supernatural. Is God going to come and do signs and wonders like he did in, in Egypt before he judged Egypt? Remember, he drowned the whole Egyptian army. Why did he do that? Because they were sacrificing the firstborn of the, of the Israelite peop, uh, people. They were killing all their children. They were drowning them in the Nile River. And then God, when he judged Egypt, he drowned the whole army in the Red Sea. What you do to a Jew, God will do to, to you. What you do a, to a child... God will do to you what you do to an innocent person, God will eventually do to you. He says, judge not lest ye be judged, for if you judge with the same measure shall, you be, shall I judge you. Exactly. So this is where we're at, and a lot of folks do not believe in this invisible realm of the spirit world. Mm -hmm. So is God going to manifest the spirit world and we're going to see some signs and wonders of warning to this generation that we've gone to the tipping point and he's going to judge the nation. And the question is, has the church tapped into everything that lies within us? You know, in that invisible realm inside of us, mm -hmm. said that God worked with the disciples, confirming the word with signs and wonders. Jesus said, greater works shall you, you do. do. Mm -hmm. But Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, walked on water, and even the wind obeyed his voice. Now, in the Old Testament, we had the Old Testament prophets. Moses stretched forth his rod, and the wind came from the east and split the waters. We have never seen that. No. In our generation, is it possible that God will do that? Not, not exactly that same miracle, but, but will he do miracles similar to that? You know, um, in Hebrews 5, 6, Paul talks about those who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of of the world to come. come. Is God going to release some of the powers of the world to come before he judges America? Mm. You know, discernment means to see with the eyes of the spirit or into the invisible realm where those ministering spirits pierce through the veil of the, of the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension is that invisible realm. The three, third dimension is height, width, and depth, and we see that with our eyes. But yes. there's that invisible realm of the fourth dimension mm -hmm. where angels exist and also demons exist. And Paul prayed in Ephesians 3.10 that the principalities and powers in heavenly place, places might be known by the church. Mm. Modern day believers should be recognizing the spiritual forces that are working in our midst. And remember, demons manifest through people. Right. So does God work through people. God works through his love, his compassion. Um, he works through the hands of people. Mm -hmm. But so does the devil. And the devil speaks through the mouths of people, and God speaks through the mouths of people. It's true. Through the foolishness of preaching, we all get saved. Mm -hmm. So there's this battle going on right now. And Paul says that the principalities and powers in the heavenly places would be known by the church. So there's this realm. And if God removes that veil, the battle in the heavenlies will manifest itself in, in the three-dimensional plane of height, width, and, and depth. depth. And we will see it. I believe... We're watching a manifestation of the flesh over this thing called Baal worship right now. Mm -hmm. Something is happening. And recently it was leaked out uh, through SCOTUS that they're going to 
give Roe versus Wade uh, back to the states and people can decide whether they want to have abortion in their state. Yes. So they're not banning abortion. No. They're just going to give it back to the people. But what is with all this? Watching these people on television that are literally losing their minds, they're having total meltdowns over this issue. Mm -hmm. And politicians are encouraging the violence. News commentators giving excuses for riots and the burning down of buildings. They're giving excuses for the, turn, the tearing down of statutes, all because they don't agree with SCOTUS' decision. And that violence that they're accepting, that's acceptable to them. But then the White House goes and says that the most violent people in America and extremists are those who want to make America great again, the Donald Trump crowd. Mm -hmm. So we're watching something and listening to something. Now, they talk about the insurrection. There was a great insurrection. There was 100,000 people there on January 6th. Right. There was 200 that stormed the, the, the Congress. Two people got killed. One was a woman who got shot by a policeman. She was unarmed. And the second person that died was a policeman who they said for six weeks was bashed in the head with a fire extinguisher. And that turned out to be a lie. Six weeks later, the coroner releases that that didn't happen. Folks, what's going on? There's something happening in the spirit realm that's manifesting. Now, you know that the devil is a liar. He's the father of confusion, the author of confusion, and the father of lies. You have to start discerning what's going on. Mm -hmm. In Ephesians 3, 7, it says, To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, this is Paul, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. This was Paul once again. I'm repeating what I said before. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's something happening that needs to be known by the church. You need to have some discernment that we're not fighting with flesh and blood here. Mm -hmm. What is God showing us? What is he preparing us for? You know, um, Karen, I, I would love to believe that the rapture of the church could take place at any moment. Um, but I don't, I don't believe that that could happen at any second. Right. I think there's some things that God wants to do with his church before he takes her away. Mm -hmm. uh, says that he will come for a bride without spot or wrinkles. And there's a lot of spot and wrinkles in us. Still, yes. Still. <laughs> And the only thing to get rid of the spot and wrinkles, in my mind, is a supernatural outpouring of God's miraculous healing power to solve our problems. You know, in Ephesians 5, uh, 27, there's a picture of how God expects his bride, the body of Christ, to be. Now, we know that Paul said that he might present to himself a glorious church this is in Ephesians 5.27, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing and that she should be holy and without blemish. Mm. Now, how can we do that and be without blemish? Nobody's perfect. No. There has to come a supernatural cleansing of our hearts in order for that to take place. Yes. Right. Only God's hand can do that. Mm-hmm. Is it possible that God will manifest himself in a way so that those who are devoted to him 
will do whatever it is necessary to get their house in order. You know, for 2,000 years, Karen, uh, God has tried to love the hell out of the church. Yes. What if he's going to release something that will scare the hell out of the church mm. immediately before Jesus returns? You know, it says in 2 Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. And yet, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom right. and knowledge. And it says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So what, is there anything hidden in Scripture that we can find that kind of foretells or, or hints of a latter-day movement where God will move almost in a militant way on the earth to separate the wheat and the chaff. And, um, you know, Nebuchadnezzar looked into the flames when those three he Hebrew boys were put in there. And when the fourth man appeared, Nebuchadnezzar got very frightened. And he said, what kind of God? There's no other God that can deliver like unto this. And that he takes authority from generation to generation. Mm. What would God do in our generation with what we see coming? You know, in 2 Kings um, 2, 1 through 14, Elisha worked for six years with the prophet Elijah. He watched his men do incredible miracles and observed the power of the Holy Spirit in Elijah's life. But when it was time for Elijah to be taken up, he asked Elisha, what do you want, Elisha? What would you like from the Lord? And Elisha said, I'd like to have a double portion of your spirit upon me. Now, you know, that was quite a thing for him to say. There were 50 other prophets of God that knew that Elijah was going to be translated to heaven. Now, that, that is a foreshadowing of the rapture. Mm -hmm. But those other prophets, they didn't follow Elijah right to the end. So they didn't receive the double portion. But Elisha did, and he received what he asked for. Now, Elijah performed seven miracles in his ministry that we know of. And the last being his ascension into heaven, accompanied by a whirlwind and chariots of fire. Yes. But after the ascension, Elisha immediately took Elijah's mantle. And the first miracle did, he said, where is the God of Elijah? And he hit the water and the water separated. And the other prophets saw it. Mm -hmm. And they said, he's got it. Yes. He's got what? He's got the anointing. The anointing of God is on him. When, when, Josh, when Joshua received um, Moses' anointing, God said, take the ark and walk into the water of the Jordan. And as soon as those priests' feet touched the water, it said the water separated and they walked across dry shot. And the people feared Joshua from that time forward because they knew the, the God of, of Moses was with him. Yes. What are we going to see, folks, mm. that we'll know that the God of Elijah and the God of Moses is with us? Mm. You know... Um, Elisha went on after he split that water. And uh, then he, he, he uh, purified water. And then some, some young boys came and mocked him. And he cursed them. And he spoke. They came and they mocked him and called him Baldy. And he, he cursed them. And a bear came and ate and, and devoured 42 young men. Now, they say they were probably young teenagers that were mocking him. They right. weren't little children. Mm -hmm. now, those are pretty heavy signs and wonders. And then when the enemies of Israel came against God's people, 
Elisha was given revelation knowledge. He knew exactly what the armies were going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's why they wanted to kill him. And, and Gehazi, they were surrounded. Elisha was surrounded by the armies of the Assyrians. And Gehazi came to him and said, what will we do? And, and Elijah says, Elisha says, there's more of us than there are of them. And Gehazi goes, one, two. That's all <laughs> he could see with his natural eyes. Yes. And Elisha says, Father, open his eyes that he might see. And Gehazi's eyes were opened and he saw thousands of warring angels standing around them. Now those demons can see those angels. <laughs> they know who they are. They know who Jesus was. And when you ask Jesus inside your heart, they know who you are. Mm. They're much more afraid of you than you should be of them. <laughs> That's when good. they start yelling and screaming and they're going to do this and they're going to do that, you shouldn't be afraid of these loudmouth morons. Because God has defeated the spirit of Baal from generation to generation to generation. There's nothing new under the sun, folks. Mm. But it's how you respond to the enemy that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. All of the prophets leaned heavily on God to show them what, shall, what should we do. What should we do, Lord? The battle is the Lord's, it's not ours. Now, a pastor wrote a book on this, Elisha receiving the double portion. And he said, consider this. Elisha could have asked for anything. He what he was offered. But he didn't seek wealth, worldly power, or status. He wanted all he might need to fulfill God's purpose and call on his life. So what are you missing in your life to fulfill your calling? What would you ask God for if he offered you anything? Mm. Asking God for you, uh, or asking God for all you need to fulfill his highest purpose for your life is a great thing to ask for. Yes. And the Bible says there's going to be a double portion released mm. in Scripture. Just like Elisha. When God's hand moves in this last manifestation of His glory, I believe we're all going to judge ourselves and not one another. When God, when God moves before He judges the nation, we're not going to be worried about what that person said or that preacher said. Or You know, when you get cancer and you know you're going to die, mm -hmm. you don't worry about anybody else. Right. You just worry about yourself. That's mm -hmm. what you're concerned with. You know, Billy Graham put it this way. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict, God's job to judge, and it's your job to love. So when these people start mouthing off and screaming and yelling, we have to look past that and you have to love those people realizing they don't know what you know. Mm. They don't know what we know. They have no clue that they are, they are blaspheming themselves when they shed innocent blood. Yes. They think it's their right to kill their own children because they don't believe in the higher power. We do. So we look at things totally different, but now we're called to be a higher standard. We're not supposed to scream back and yell back, but we can answer with wisdom and conviction in our hearts and let them know why we think what we think. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, uh, in war, it says that there's, there's no atheists in foxholes. When the bullets are whizzing past your head and the bombs are exploding, you're not worrying about everybody else. You're worrying about number one. Yeah. Now, that's not a selfish thing. It's human nature. But it's a human nature thing. 
And what, you, what we need to do, instead of worrying what this preacher said or that preacher said or this guy doesn't do this or this person doesn't do that, we need to start looking at ourselves and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Right. How, what, what do you want me to do with the gifts or the callings that I've got? And that's why we offered the 10 books the other day. Maybe it's just sending the, a book to somebody. Mm -hmm. but, but, but this next move of God, what's coming, if we're interpreting correctly, there's going to be a massive move and it's going to release fear in the body of Christ. So there's a personal warfare that you do and then there's a corporate warfare that's going to take place. What part are you going to play in the army of God? Mm -hmm. Now for 30 years I was in business, Karen, and I provided provision to the men that I believed in. Now I'm a little on the other side and I'm on television and I'm providing my own provision to help. <laughs> but I, I'm not, I, I'm still tithing, but um, it, I, I kind of, I feel like I've been called to the front line with a voice now, but behind the scenes I was always serving those other men, just like Elisha served Elijah. Exactly. So now here I am. And I'm, I am praying all the time, God, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. You know, we're writing another book. Um, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm 68 years old. What do you want me to do, Lord? Because I don't know when I'm going to die. No. But I want to go out strong, folks. Yeah. And so do you. Yes. And we all should because we're getting close. Now, when Elijah called down fire on Mount Horeb, he was fighting the spirit of Baal worship. And the spirit of Baal worship was defiling the nation. Mm. And the Bible does not describe those watching the event. When he called down fire, they, people were not clapping and standing ovations. Nobody was shouting, preach it, Elijah. There was no celebrity status for the prophet. None whatsoever. There were no B3 organs playing in the background while he was preaching. And dun, 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 dun. There was <laughs> nothing like that. There were no flashing lights, no fog machines, no man-made hype. There was no performance orientation whatsoever. It was God manifesting himself. Mm. A holy, reverent fear of God swept through the crowd. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 18.39... And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord of Elijah, He is the Most High God. This was a one-time event where God stood up against the spirit of Baal worshippers. And of course, then we know that Elijah went and cut off the heads of 450 prophets of Baal. I don't believe God's going to have us do that. We're not going to get into violence. No. But don't be surprised if God shows up in the next little while with some manifestations and it's not going to be a laughing matter and it's not going to be a laughing matter when he judges this nation. No. It's going to be a sobering sobering event and these people who are fighting God they're going to hit the floor and they're going to scream out but it'll be too late now is the time to seek God and a lot of us are maybe fighting with different spirits different thoughts different attitudes that have been overcoming us and we got to stand up and get angry at that and get rid of these things in our life Yes. It, whether it's morality, immorality, uh, pornography, you got to get this stuff out of you. And sometimes the love of God doesn't do it, but I'll guarantee you the fear of God will. Yes. And He's given us a spirit that we can overcome. And we do not have a spirit of fear, 
but we have a spirit of holy reverence towards him. Folks, I get up every morning and one hour, 45 minutes, I'm in the word every morning and say, God, what do you want me to do today? What's the assignment? Uh, and some of you, of course, are working and it, it's hard, but you should devote some time, just 30 minutes a day and get in that word mm -hmm. and, and get your assignment. So um, as repentance sweeps throughout the believers, there'll be a certain purity or unity of purpose that will activate, I believe, God's Air Force. And we may see a tremendous manifestation of angels. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go here to um, James five seven. Now here's my point. In James five seven, Paul prays this prayer: "Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord, for the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth, that's you and I, and has long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Now, what is Paul talking about? Jesus is waiting patiently for something to happen before he comes. He's waiting for the early and the latter rain. The precious fruit is the souls of the people. That's John 15, 16. And if we've interpreted scripture correctly, there'll be a great harvest before he comes to take his bride off this planet. Now, water in the ancient world and in some parts of the world today is an extremely important commodity. God's Spirit is often symbolized in Scripture by water or rain. Uh, in Ezekiel 25 through 27 says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. The prophet uses the precious resource of water to describe how God cleanses our hearts. So Hosea prophesied concerning the Lord, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. That's Hosea 6.3. And we see in this passage that there's two stages of, of Christ's coming, a former and a latter and Hosea compa compared that appearance as rain or water being poured out upon us. Now, uh, a commentary, one of the commenta commentaries said that rain here is a symbol of moral and spiritual refreshment. The Lord will revive his people if they would but turn to him. And Yahweh would water the earth like the latter rain. The produce of the soil depended on the early and latter rain falling in late autumn and in the spring. Now, this is the normal process of harvesting, harvesting. in, in uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. But to those who seek Yahweh, Yahweh will truly provide a water of life. Now, 20 years before Hosea gave this prophecy, the prophet Joel warns us that the day of the Lord is coming and he tells us, turn ye even to me with all your heart. And then he gives us a metaphorical prophecy using the analogy as when God sends both the early and the latter rain to provide water for the abundance of crops. He said, be glad ye children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. However, that analogy is followed by him saying, and it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heaven and the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke, before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples received the Holy Spirit, Peter um, quoted from Joel. And he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
and it shall come to pass in the day, saith the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now listen, Joel prophesied that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. But Peter said God was pouring out of his spirit. The latter rain or outpouring of God's spirit started pouring out of the believers on the day of Pentecost. Here's a spout. Here's a spout where the latter rain pours out. That was the day God's kingdom came into the believers as Jesus said it would. The latter rain began on the day of Pentecost. So it poured out of our spirits. His spirit came into us. He energized us. And then we began to speak. The disciples began to speak in other languages, 15 different dialects. And there's 600 million people on the earth right now that have had that experience. So you can see here that the latter rain started pouring out of the disciples on the day of Pentecost. The presence of God within the believer allows him to hear God's voice and walk in his ways. However, the anointing of God comes when the Spirit of God comes upon a man or a woman, empowering them with divine energy to do supernatural works to fulfill a specific task. Mm. When Jesus read in the, in the synagogue, he quoted the prophet Isaiah and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. From that time forward, Jesus went about preaching, teaching, and healing people. He had a divine energy on him to do these miracles, signs, and wonders. And the Gospels and much of the New Testament record all the different things that Jesus did. And even the wind obeyed his voice. Now in Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, he prophesies and he says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, meaning you and me, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, upon Jesus, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, Jesus, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, said the Lord, from henceforth and forever. God says whatever Jesus had is going to come upon us. Right. Now we're already in a position where the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit operate. But there's a, an outpouring coming that will far exceed that of what we've seen today. God promised that the same spirit upon Christ and the words he spoke would also come upon his followers. Now here's, here's another prophecy from Isaiah 60. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Right now we have entered into some of the grossest darkness that man has ever had. We are like Sodom and Gomorrah. We're like the, the time before um, Noah. Before Noah, we're exactly as the time when uh, um, not only Noah, but Sodom and Gomorrah. The time when Babylon says, get thee into darkness. Mm. We're here, folks. Mm -hmm. This is gross darkness that's coming on the land. And he says, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy shining. Then thou shalt see and flow together and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee and the Gentiles shall come unto thee. So when a person accepts Christ as Savior, we're promised that the Holy Spirit would come inside of us and dwell. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I will come into him and sup with him. And Jesus confirmed this to his disciples when he said, I'll pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, that he shall abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth. 
and he shall be in you. John 15, or 14, 16. The whole foundation of salvation through Jesus is based on God's grace, for by grace are you saved through faith. But what about after the day of Pentecost, when the early reign spirit of the Lord comes upon the last day believers, as it did with Jesus? Have we seen the full capacity of that yet? I don't believe we have, folks. We have not seen that thy heart shall fear and be enlarged. There's no fear of God whatsoever in our nation or around the world. And the abundance of the sea has not been converted unto the Lord as Isaiah prophesied. Mm -hmm. So does this mean we are going to see an awesome move of God? It's not going to be a hand clapper. It's not going to be a ha, ha, ho, ho, the joy of the Lord. It's going to be an awesome, reverent fear that sweeps through us. And just like at Elijah's time, People are going to hit the floor and they're going to call out to God. And God will answer. Yes. He will separate the wheat and the chaff and it'll take place. But it's not going to come through the hand of the flesh. Now, next week, we're a little bit out of time right now. But next week, we're going to continue on with this. And we're going to talk about the seven spirits of God that came upon Jesus. He operated and he manifested the seven spirits of God were on him. Now, we as normal people, Christians, we look to apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, and we expect them to carry the anointing. But we really don't expect ourselves to because we say, who am I? Right. Who am I, to, I? I mean, I'm not. And we, we put all these people up on pedestals. But you know what? There's coming a time when God may put his spirit on us. And we're going to see this stuff happen. And we should be, according to scripture, the word Nebuchadnezzar means broken vessel. Nebuchadnezzar was not broken until he looked in and he saw the fourth man. Yes. And it broke him. He was scared. Maybe God is going to break us. Maybe he's going to break us like the potter. And we're going to move in a dimension with God that we've never moved in before. Now, I, I think this is very, very possible because the gross darkness that we see now today with critical race theory, with the LGBT going into the schools, with the grooming of children, with what they're doing and putting in children's minds. Remember what you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. We are in for a battle, but the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. But we can't do anything unless God God is with us. Yes. We have to have the anointing. We must have the anointing. Mm -hmm. And it's available. And it's prophesied to come. When? At the darkest time of humanity, when it's so dark, right before Babylon gets judged, God will sweep her with an anointing. He will release the fear of God He'll separate the wheat and the chaff. And those, when, those who wanted God on Mount Carmel, they hit the floor and they said, the Lord, the God of Elijah, he is the most high God, the God of Elijah. But you know what? Those other Baal worshipers, they dug their heels in and Elijah had to cut their heads off. Mm -hmm. Now God's not going to call us to do that. But he's going to cut their heads off. He's going to burn. According to scripture, we've got 53 descriptions of Latter-day Babylon. And the 54th has eight 
seven or eight verses where in one day she'll come to nothing. She'll be burned by fire. We don't know when that is, folks, but we're on 53 right now. And when you include the curses of the nation that have come in the last year since the Biden administration, we're literally at 57 because she's broken covenant and she's under judgment right now. And this is what we're seeing. These people are screaming for it. Yes. And we're not to hate them. We're not to scream back at them. We're not to judge them. We're not to judge them. But we can certainly discern the spirit that is working through them. And it's not rational. It's not even... It, they don't even want to talk to you. They want to cancel anything and everybody who gets in their way, like Stalin, like Mussolini, like Hitler. That is not the spirit of God working through people. That's another spirit. It's a Marxist antichrist spirit. And remember, the antichrist and the ten horns will hate the woman and they will make war with the lamb. That's you and me. Mm. But we're going to go into this war and we're not going in with ourselves. We're going to go in with weapons of warfare that this world knows not of. And we're going to talk about that next week. That's exciting. We are done, folks. Thank you for listening. Um, next week, we are going to talk about the seven spirits of God and how they work through Jesus and how it's very possible that same anointing that Jesus had is going to come upon the church and we're going to see some things that are going to be very sobering before the trumpet sounds. The dead in Christ rise first and then we go up. We're getting very close. Folks, thank you so much. My name is Rick Pearson. This is Karen Pearson. We pray that God would bless you, that he would be with you, that he would shine his face upon you, in your, in your laughter, in your leisure, in your labor, in every area of your life. May God be with you and the Holy Spirit bless you and be with you. We release the angels around you and around your family. In Jesus' name, we'll see you next week on Prophecy USA. Shalom.